I'll hand over to you, Priscilla. Thank you. Thanks, Darlene. Um, and thanks Adset for the opportunity to um, present my work and um, you're right, it's a nice opportunity to, um, to be sharing this in Mental Health Week. Um, so today I'm going to be, my, the topic of my presentation is juggling feeling capable and different um, and this is work I did um, as part of my PhD. Um, so I think between 2012 and 2016 I was, I was working on this piece of work and I want to acknowledge my um, two supervisors, Professor Ellie Fossey and Associate Professor Lindsay Howie. Um, we did this work when I was um, a, a candidate at La Trobe University and they were both working there at that time and they, they're no longer working there now and, and neither am I. Um, so I wanted to acknowledge my current workplace which is near my national um, and we're a, we're a large uh, national provider of um, community mental health services. Um, so it's really nice to be applying my research skills in, um, in a different setting but still, still using all of these. I came to this um, topic for my PhD study because I'd worked in um, clinical mental health services as an occupational therapist for a long time and I was, I, I tried many times to support people who that I, I was um, working with back into study and most times it wasn't a great success so whether that was, I was supporting students to go back into TAFE or to university, um, things often didn't work out as well as we'd hoped and um, often students found that they couldn't complete their studies. And then I, I had a sort of a career shift and I went and was teaching occupational therapy at university and I was teaching um, many of my courses that I was teaching um, were around mental health as a topic and I found that as soon as I started to talk about mental health um, as a, a subject topic, um, students would approach me and start to share their experiences. Um, so I often found that I was a, a magnet within the, the, the courses that I ran for students to um, share their experiences. And I, and I started to read the literature about, um, you know, what are the best ways to support students with mental health issues at university. and. I guess I was thinking the literature had a large gap and that was the gap was the voices of students themselves. So there was there was a whole lot of ideas about what students needed but it weren't, wasn't necessarily coming from the students themselves so um, I felt like it would be really useful to actually spend time with students talking to them um, and um, get their perspectives so that's sort of the, the starting point of um, my talk. If people are interested in emailing me or chatting with me afterwards, please feel free to email. I'm really happy to talk further. I'm fairly passionate about this topic um, still. So what I set out to do was to um, generate a, a theory that was grounded in the experience of students themselves about studying at university while they were living with mental ill health and distress. And um, so I used a constructivist grounded theory method, um, really um, using the work of Cathy Charmaz as a, as a central guide. And I also used a participatory approach. Um, and I wanted to do that because I really wanted to have people with mental health issues involved right from the start. Um, so uh, people with mental health issues were invited to to work with me on this project as part of a critical reference group and they were involved in um, thinking about how to frame the study, how to, what sort of questions I should be asking students. They worked with me over two and a half years um, where they supported the work I did in analysis of the data. Um, they were really a touchstone in all the analysis process and I've, I've worked with some of the participants in that group to disseminate the findings as well and hope to do a little bit more in that space. Um, so they were the main methodological approaches. So who was involved in the study? So there was 21 people um, with a um, lived experience of mental ill health and university study were part of my um, uh, the overall sample. So that involved the critical reference group that I mentioned um, and the critical reference group included um, I think there was 
five, six people overall over the two and a half years, uh, four at any one time. Myself and my two supervisors were part of the critical reference group and we had, we had 12 meetings over those two and a half years. And then there were 15 in-depth interviews that I conducted with students um, at one university, at La Trobe, where I was working at the time. And I did, I went back to six of those people to do follow-up interviews 12 months later and then I followed up with them again um, by email and um, three of them sent me written responses so that um, in grounded theory the whole idea is that um, you you do some analytic work, you put those ideas back to the participants and they comment and you, it's a back and forth process like that. So I had two ways of going back to people. I was, I was going back to some of the people that I'd interviewed but I was also going back to this critical reference group um, and they were supporting um, my understanding of and meaning making from the data. So this is a little snapshot of the 15 interview participants. Um, they were aged between 21 and 39 years, so a mean age of 26 years. So possibly a little bit older than your average university student, but in a way they maybe that makes sense because people talked about um, a slowed down process of participating or getting started with or coming back to university. There were 10 people in bachelor programs and five postgraduates um, and there were 10 females and five males. Um, I, didn't, I didn't ask people specifically to talk a whole lot about their mental ill health but um, people shared um, these self-reported diagnoses. So people often talked about having more than one diagnosis. So as you can see there, that adds up to more than the, the overall sample. But 13 people talked about depression, six anxiety, two with psychosis, one with post-traumatic stress disorder, one with bipolar disorder, and one with um, obsessive compulsive disorder. What, what was interesting when people shared their stories with me is that they, there was some commonalities in their additional experiences. So um, 12 of the 15 people had, had experiences of trauma, um, either in their child, childhood, adolescence or early adulthood. Um, seven talked about having parents with a mental health issue. Six talked about having a sibling with a mental health issue. Um, two people were incredibly isolated, so they really were not having social contact with anyone else through the, through the time that I spoke with them. Um, and six, at the initial interview, six of the 15 people were using more formalised supports. Interestingly, when I went back to um, six people again, some people had taken up supports during that intervening year. Um, so they were using, um, you know, maybe it was a doctor, a, a psychologist, a counsellor or a university support, but it certainly wasn't the majority of people um, were connected with supports. I, I recruited this participant group by um, sticking up some posters around the university and I was really, that was a concern for me that I wouldn't actually find participants, it, people wouldn't be willing to come forward and talk. And I, I think I went around and did a, a sort of stuck up posters and before I got back to my office I had a phone call and it was actually very, very easy to recruit people. I had, I had more than these 15 people contact me um, but some people were, you know, couldn't make the interviews or, or had, you know, became more unwell before we managed to hook up a time to speak. Um, but um, I think, I, yeah, I had over, there was around 21 people who contacted me in a fairly short space of time. Um, so no shortage of people out there who were interested in the topic and willing to talk. So the main part of my talk today is really the findings, the sort of theoretical ideas that I came up with. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk you through those now. Um, so this is, this is the way that I've ended up constructing, or we, the critical reference group and I, have ended up constructing the findings um, through a long process of data analysis. And we certainly acknowledge that this is not the only story that could have been drawn from the data, um, but this certainly felt like an important story. It's a story that's not really described anywhere else in the literature as far as I can see. And it's, um, 
a story that resonated with people as I put it back to them and it's certainly a story that's resonated with um, when I've presented this this um, presentation more broadly. So I'll be interested to hear how you how you find the the um, conceptualization and and um, any responses that you have to it. So the way I've understood things is that um, studying at university is like a vortex. So if you imagine like a, a tornado, it's spinning and it's creating its own force. And people are drawn into the vortex because they feel capable. So they're, they're drawn towards this learning, studying experience because they feel like they've got the capacity and their life experiences and their current situation um, tells them that this is the right place for them. So they're drawn with a force into that, that vortex. So I think it's really important to emphasise this, this finding of feeling capable. Um, so this is what some of the participants said. Um, feeling capable, university is the right place for me. So um, Kate said, I guess I was just naturally gifted with learning. I had a really good memory in terms of remembering the content and I always did well in my tests. And Maxwell talked about having an appetite to learn and Betty said something is something that I'm really good at. Um, I'm good at reading, I have an inquiring mind, I'm curious, I like to write and think. So there was this real sense of university as the right place for me. But um, a really core finding shared by all the people that I spoke with was that as well as feeling capable, students talked about feeling different. Um, so I conceptualise this feeling different as the central core around which the experience of studying spins. So while students are drawn into the vortex, they're spinning around this central idea of feeling different. Um, now I, I don't claim to have worked out exactly why students feel different um, and I think that's a really complicated idea that's frequently talked about as um, or sort of put in the basket of stigma and I my sense of it is after thinking about it this a lot is that I don't fully understand that and I'm not sure stigma explains the whole experience um, but anyway people spoke to me about that they did feel different and some spoke about feeling different from a very early age while for others it was a sense that they became more of aware of while they were during the course of their studies. Um, uh, feeling feeling different was was universally held but it was not connected to people's diagnosis. Um, so there was, it was just this sense of feeling different. So the way I've set up this, this image is that towards the bottom of the vortex, people feel more different. Um, and towards the top of the vortex, they feel less different. So people might enter the vortex at any point and move up and down um, the vortex across their, their experience of study. So this is a few of people's comments talking about feeling different. Um, Maxwell said, I really felt like an outsider. I felt like nobody understood me. And Stacey said, the world expects you to be normal and I don't think I live up to that expectation. And for Mackenzie, it was, my parents separated when I was a baby. My dad is an ex-bikey. My mum has a mental illness and we were always quite poor when I was growing up. So I felt like I had all these things that made me feel different from a really young age. I've internalised being different a lot. It's part of my identity. So there was this really common idea, people talked about it in different ways, but it all came back to this, this sense of feeling different. So students on entering university seem to be sharing this common goal, which was this striving to be just like everyone else, just a regular student, um, an ordinary student, a normal student, however they use different different terms for it. But they just wanted to fit in, they wanted to learn, they wanted to gain a qualification, they wanted to meet their potential um, and university was, was their pathway to, to reaching that potential. But when they, when they felt this sense of difference they, and they were striving to be a regular student, they needed to find ways to manage that sense of difference. Um, and they, they, quite a few of them talked about this is not a, this is not a um, linear pathway so that they might feel more or less different at different times and they might need to use more or less different strategies across their time of being a student. 
So if you imagine this is a vortex, um, at the top there's probably less force, at the bottom there's more force. So as, as, as people were drawn down into the vortex, they felt more different and there was less space for them to less, um, I guess the, the force and the pressure was more unrelenting so um, they needed, needed more active ways to manage feeling different. Towards the top there's more space, there's less force so there was less effort in managing um, feeling different but, it, but there was still effort. Even at the top they talked about well it, it just never quite let, lets you go so you, there's always something you have to be doing to manage this sense of difference. So these are a couple of quotes. People talked about striving to be regular. Um, Nicole said, I don't want to be different. I just want to be a regular student. And Renji said, I just want to be accepted as normal and not have anyone else know. Um, and I'm sure many of you who worked in this space can relate to that idea of, you know, not wanting to share it, not wanting to disclose, um, struggling on their own. So this was sort of the, the final model picture that I came up with. Um, and it, it sort of, um, as people are striving to be regular students, they feel both capable and different and um, managing difference is an active process that they have to do. And they do that by, um, I, I sort of grouped it into three different ways. Towards the top, they're reconciling difference. In the middle, they're wrestling with difference. Towards the bottom, they're hanging in with difference. And then at the bottom, um, you'll see that there's dropping out, letting go of hopes, falling out of study, tolerating despair and and the, the, that loop of falling out actually f leads back in because all of the students I spoke to were um, currently students so everyone I spoke to was studying but several of them had dropped out um, I think uh, eight had dropped out before and three had dropped out more than once so um, I think this bottom part of the loop is a really important part because sometimes when students um, who really feel like university is the place for them, dropping out is absolutely devastating and they feel like that is going to be the end of their study story and I think many students can and do find a way back to, of returning back to study and I think that's a really important message to be able to convey to people that maybe this time isn't the right time for you but there are, there are pathways back to study. Um, yeah, okay, so I'm going to talk about each of these phases in a bit more detail to tell you some of the detail that people spoke about. So starting at the bottom, people talked about not managing difference and dropping out. Um, this, this was a, a time of real devastation for people. Sometimes it was a brief relief that they could just let go and that, you know, suddenly the pressure was off, um, but all of them felt real despair. Um, and had to work out ways to tolerate that um, and then think about what to do next. So people dropped out when their effort required exceeded their capacity or their resources um, to stick at study. Um, it felt like a failure. So people spoke about letting go of their hopes. So um, one woman I spoke to said, I couldn't do an oral presentation so I just dropped out. And it was at that moment she just knew she couldn't go on, so she, she didn't tell anyone, she just stopped coming. Um, while others talked about falling out of study, um, it started off going, this is a quote, um, it's, it started off going to all the lectures and all the labs, and then I started skipping lectures and only attending labs. Then the labs became too hard because I didn't know the content, because I didn't attend the lectures. So you start skipping the labs and by the end of semester, Yes, it just sort of trickles off down that way. Then by the end of semester, you're not attending at all. So this sense of just gradually people, um, you know, falling out of study slowly. Um, whereas, whereas for Reggie, um, he talked about, well, I just got kicked out because I went crazy. I missed all my exams and I went crazy. Um, yeah, so there were, there were different ways um, that people fell out. People talked about tolerating the despair and when they, were, when they were in that state they talked about feeling numb, hollow, getting out of my head, feeling completely alone and a complete failure, ending up in hospital. One person said it was like hitting bottom. And then people talked about um, finding ways to return to study, feeling the pull to come back. Um, maybe they were re-evaluating their goals and values 
use. And some people talked about feeling like they were forced to come back, so forced for financial reasons, so like they were going to lose all their Centrelink payments, so um, enrolling in part-time study at least was a way to um, maintain some of their payments. And um, some students spoke about family forcing them to come back, particularly one international student. Um, was having a real struggle and, and had several periods of dropping out, but um, family wouldn't accept that there was um, there was another option. So um, she found her way coming back to coming back to study. Then we have towards the bottom part of the vortex. So this is the this is the part where students were hanging in with difference. So here they described. Um, all the space was at the pointy end of the vortex is taken up by difference. So they, they describe this constant pressure, extreme effort, effort to tolerate and persist with the demands of studying. Um, at this point, participants were not typically reaching out for help. Um, they talked about their identity as being dominated by difference. So they, they talked about being alone, isolated, just hanging in, um, not feeling like, like they had a whole lot of choice. It was just a, a daily battle. So um, they talked about being alone, or if they weren't alone, they felt alone. So they could be surrounded by supportive others, but they still had this sense of feeling alone. Um, hanging in was done in isolation. There was little choice to do anything differently, and they, they felt really stuck with that. And um, you know, I really want to emphasise the fluid nature of participants' experiences. Nearly all the students I spoke to um, could relate to this period of hanging in with difference when they felt alone, stuck, um, unable to reach out for help. Um, so for some of them this was very acute at the time that I interviewed them, but for others it was a memory. So people talked about moving up and down in the vortex over time. Um, so these were the, the four main themes that, that fitted with hanging in with difference. People talked about concealing who I am. Nicole said, I don't let people know who I am. So there was a sense of you had to protect yourself from the world. Um, and Natalie said, so I'm not good. I don't like people to see. I've always incorrectly seen it as a massive weakness. I don't like to tell anybody that there's been a problem. No, I've never revealed or tried to play on it or anything like that. It's like a secret shame. And they also talked about retreating from the social world. So they, they talked about um, you know, moving away from people, moving into spaces where they could be by themselves. Um, someone said, not having to deal with people and all their talking and all their subtleties. Um, people talked about sleeping, retreating to bed, retreating to their rooms. Um, I didn't want to do anything. What I did was just had lots and lots of sleep. That's what Stacey talked about. People talked about all the, all the methods they used to numb or smother their distress. They talked about alcohol, drugs, cutting, burning, binging or purging on food, gaming, um, and allowing themselves to become obsessed with ideas or projects, you know, ways to lose themselves. Um, one, one student talked about his world of Warcraft addiction. Um, and another one said, you know, I just drink by myself at home. There was nothing social about it. It was just, it was just um, uh, numbing the pain. And other people talked about battling my thoughts. Um, so I think it was Michelle, yeah, she said, all the negative stuff comes up and then I've just got to counteract it with logical stuff. But yeah, it's a daily think. I still have to work on it. So they talked about this effortful process of having to, to think through their days, force themselves to get on the tram, get to university, that sort of thing. Um, and Mackenzie said, sometimes I think about dropping out. Before exams, I was like, I'm going to fail. I'm just going to drop out. Um, I just need to. I guess I, I need to just reason with myself and be like, you've made it this far, you might as well at least try the exams. That's what I had to do. It was just like you, you might as well go and you might pass. It's better than having fails. So there's this constant talking themselves around. Then we move to the, the centre of the vortex where people were talking about wrestling with difference. So in this middle part of the vortex, people described um, 
there was still lots of pressure, but there was a bit more space. So they had a bit more space where they could negotiate their relationship with difference. So um, I sort of described it as a wrestle. So sometimes they were on top of things and they were, they were managing things and they were going in a forward direction, but then they could quite easily um, lose ground. So lose their footing um, and, the, and their sense of difference would really get on top of them again. So there were times when they had greater agency and choice and control and then there were times where they lost that. So it was a real up and down sort of time in this, in this wrestling process. Um, but, but in this wrestling process, people were, um, were certainly able to talk more about the future focus, having have a more positive, optimistic future. Space of possibility but also challenge. So these were the, I'll go through the, the themes under wrestling difference a little bit slower. So they talked about coming to know themselves um, and, and part of that was acknowledging and revealing their difference and allowing some vulnerability. So um, here this person said, I'm just really at the moment fixated with allowing myself to breathe emotionally and maybe take stock of what I've learnt through uni. It's been a real process of self-discovery. God, I've come so far from being like just every day suicidal and anxious and unhappy to actually just be able to go for a walk and just feel at peace rather than just always in my head criticising myself. And that's huge. Um, she, was about to, she was about to complete. She was just a few weeks away from completing her bachelor's degree. Um, and allowing vulnerability, so people spoke about letting their guard down, considering connecting with others, so they're actually thinking about reaching out. Um, they were acknowledging the unpredictability of their situation. Um, Reggie, one, one guy I spoke to, he said, you know, I wonder if I'm relapsing now. Um, I wonder if I'm slowly just, I wonder if maybe I'm going downhill and um, that's the thing because there's always chaos and stress going on. How do I know if I'm in a healthy frame of being or if I'm not? How do I know if I'm going off the rails? You think you'd be able to judge your own state of sanity, but it just seems like to me I could quite easily relapse and I'd never know. So there was this real sense of you know, becoming more aware, but also being aware of just how vulnerable or fragile people's situations were sometimes. So that was coming to know self. People People also spoke about accepting limits in this part of the, um, the vortex. So they talked about ab adapting their expectations of self. So they were talking about, you know, becoming more or less flexible with their, um, more flexible with their expectations of self. So they were, they were saying, you know, maybe it's okay if I don't get straight A's. Um, maybe that's not the end of the world. They also spoke, um, this one, knowing limits, keeping death as plan C, is an interesting one. Um, you know, I heard several students talk about a very similar concept to this, and as I shared it with other students and said, "Is you know, have you ever come across this?" People really related to this as an idea. Um, it's always been my plan C. Plan A, try to do something. Plan B, try again. Plan C, effort, die. It has been the plan for years. I'm not going to accept failure. I'm not. The problem with that is suicide is a motivator. I don't want to be a kitchen hand, so I must study. If I start to fail in study, well, I'm not going to be a kitchen hand again. I'll choose death. And these students were not actively suicidal, um, but it was it was like it was there in the back of their minds um, as a bit of a as a bit of a backup plan. Um, and I, I think that's a really interesting. You know, I think we don't always think about. Um, uh, the, the background suicidal thinking rather than the foregrounded suicidal thinking. And I think, um, uh, you know, that's another interesting area to explore. Um, and then the other, the other big theme here was seizing control of what I can. So there was this sense of people were just doing, just doing something, just doing something positive and active um, was a helpful thing. Um, they talked about managing environments and demands and they talked about connecting with others and using supports. So they spoke about being proactive, wanting something better and taking action to achieve it. Um, uh, who said this? Sam said, um, I'm like, this is not what I want and I just got really scared. She was talking about um, taking lots of drugs. 
So I just got really scared and then I reached out to friends and counselling services and I made an explicit decision just to totally quit because it was like, I don't want this, I don't need it, it's not helping me. So she made this choice to actually actively make a change. Um, and people spoke about managing their environments and their demands. So um, that might have been their social environments, um, their study demands, whatever. So um, when they were feeling less capable, they did things like deciding to study part-time, dropping a subject, or choosing to just let one of their subjects go. Um, and they found ways to manage things like group work. Um, so finding a partner who would be prepared to work at their pace in a, in a paired lab um, prac, or finding, finding a group of students that they could tolerate doing some of their group work with was a, was a massive relief. Um, if they couldn't find that group of students and they couldn't manage those environments, that was a real stressor. And I know that's a, that's a really common theme. Students talk about the group work can be really, really hard. Um, when they felt more capable, they could participate in more things and they could be in spaces that were more demanding. When they were less capable, they, they managed that. They also talked about connecting with other people. So here was the, here was the point they talked about using supports. Sometimes they were using professional supports, counselling on campus, psychologists, doctors, psychiatrists, but frequently it was informal support. So they were really, um, you know, informally going and speaking to one teacher and just feeling like some sort of connection and support through that one teacher, um, a friend, finding a friend, um, a family member, those sorts of things. Um, one student said, I find, I find services, she was talking about university services, support services, I find services are hard to access. I guess just because I have anxiety and it's scary. Also because of the stigma around mental illness and stuff. I'm afraid to talk to teachers about it. I don't tell them why I need extensions and stuff because I'm worried what they would think. I'm worried they would not take it seriously. So while there was this sense of reaching out and support, using supports was a good thing, there were also a whole lot of challenges around that and, you know, there's certainly been a lot of talk of that, that um, the barriers to um, reaching out for supports in the literature. So to summarise, wrestling with difference, this central part of the vortex was all about coming to know self, accepting limits and seizing control of what I can. Um, there was this real sense of wrestling um, it was a space of possibility, but also challenge. And then towards the top of the vortex, um, people spoke about um, reconciling difference. So here, difference was less dominant. There was space for other identities to coexist. Um, people could be accepting of their difference, able to maybe celebrate their difference, um, because difference, the difference felt less negative. Um, there was less pressure, there was a range of options. People talked about reframing, um, reframing things. They had more of a future orientation, um, and some of them had this sense of activism, so they, were, they wanted to just share their learning. There was a pursuit of rights. Um, People spoke about embracing well-being, so they were focusing on their health rather than their ill health. They spoke about doing things like getting exercise, sleep, having good relationships, having balance in their life, enjoying study. They talked about holding hope. Um, this is a nice quote from Reggie, you know, you know what, I can still be whatever I want and I can still go out and get a job. I can, or maybe not be whatever I want, but I still can have a good life and I can do all these things that everyone can do and that I'm not limited really at all. All I've got to do is have a plan and just follow it and I'll be okay. Um, and Reggie, between the two times that I interviewed Reggie, he'd, um, he'd been... Um, He'd lost his accommodation because of his mental health, ill health. He'd had quite a long stint in hospital. He'd had a period back living at home and then he'd found his feet, was back in a flat, was back at university full time. So he'd had a real roller coaster of a ride, but that was all, all in the course of 12 months. Um, and he still had this sense of really holding hope for his future. People talked about positive risk taking, so they were they were feeling like they were ready to tackle old issues. Um, you know, some of them were talking about you know going back and dealing with some family stuff that they hadn't dealt with uh, for a long time, that sort of thing. And 
people talked about this this vigilance, watching out for ill health. So not just assuming there was never going to be another problem, but um, just being aware of flare-ups and, and having a, a proactive plan and strategies for managing things into the future. So this is the this is the overall summary. Um, striving to be a regular student. Um, students feel capable, but they also feel different, and they find ways to manage that sense of difference. Um, so then I thought about well, what's what's actually um, causing people to go down in the spiral or up in the vortex? Um, so thinking about. What are the things that confirm student sense of difference, and what are the things that allow space for difference? And um, these were some of the, the some of the the themes that came out strongly. Um, is that categorising confirms difference? Um, negative messaging. Um, while most of the participants had at least one positive relationship that buffered the impacts of difference. Um, uh, messages from others could really confirm their sense of difference um, and as if people did try to reach out um, and connect with supports or, or reach out to other people that if they were if they if they got negative messages um, that really made them shy of trying again um, that sense of negative messages from others confirmed their sense that they were unworthy or deficient or wrong somehow people talked about um, Isolation is confirming difference and that makes sense because you don't have any of the positive messages coming in. The more, pe more isolated people get, the more disconnected they get from any um, uh, you know, ch messages that challenge that, they're, you know, that they, they can manage. And um, silencing confirms difference. It, it contributes to that sense of isolation. So I think students spoke about that there's no shared space where they can wonder where they can wonder what's happening for me now, why do I feel like this, why is there this sense of difference, how can I manage, what do people do when they're in this situation. And the things that allowed space for difference, um, I, 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 like the, I like the work of Iris Marion Young who argues for a politics that attends to rather than represses difference. Um, and I think if in, in the university context this would be where um, there's not a, an effort to correct people's deficits, um, trying to make students better fit the fairly normative environment of the academy, but um, you know having an environment where people can acknowledge difference, um, welcome, celebrate the beneficial contribution, beneficial beneficial contribution of students with diverse experiences. Um, you know, I kept I was I was struck through the whole study about how amazing these students are, like what they do cope with, what they do bring, um, their strength, and um, I think that's that's not always the message that we hear. Belonging um, helps people move up the spiral, finding a place where they belong, and um, when students did find a space to speak out and share their experience, that also seemed to to help them um, belong and um, connect. So in conclusion, um, I found that the experience of study for, for people living with mental ill health and distress, really it was essentially about feeling different as well as feeling capable. Um, the experience of feeling different for students in this study was not just about having a diagnosed mental illness, experiencing symptoms or behaving uncharacteristically. While any of these may contribute to feeling different, they were not essential to the experience. What was essential, however, was a personal sense of self as different in comparison to others or in comparison to one's past self or imagined future self. Participants actively managed this sense of difference, um, but these essential actions were mostly unhidden, mostly hidden and unspoken. Consequently, students felt that they alone were the only ones feeling different or engaging in the effortful work of managing that difference. This also means that the efforts of these students are largely hidden to the university and this understanding therefore doesn't contribute to policies and practice. A goal might be supporting students to realise that I'm less different than I thought or maybe we are all similar and different. 
By illuminating the hidden processes students use to manage feeling both capable and different, this study gives voice to the student experience. It shows that students with mental ill health are adaptive, resilient and resourceful and that many find ways to cope, to persist with, return to and succeed at study with or without professional supports. The study affirms that many students experience real concerns, suffering and distress and acknowledges that many students benefit from professional supports on and off campus. However, the findings challenge the idea that diagnostic labels provide a helpful way of categorising student issues or needs or predicting success in the student role. The findings provide an alternative to the dominant messages around professional help seeking as the only legitimate means to manage mental ill health and distress. Communicating the findings of this study to students may clarify how common the experience of feeling different is and it may shed light on the active ways students manage feeling different. Greater awareness may decrease students' sense of difference or shame as they seek to stay in study. Increased investment in peer support within universities is warranted where students with lived experience of mental ill health can share their experiences, challenge stereotypes and create inclusive spaces. So I just thought I'd, I'd put up a couple of questions that um, you know I think it's worth pondering over um, and I've certainly pondered over um, and maybe ask if anyone has any questions they'd like to ask. Fantastic, thank you Priscilla, that was great. I, um, I was really taken by the, um, the statement, um, uh, you know, attend to difference rather than um, yeah, about the differences. So I was really kind of taken by that statement. So thank you. Um, if anybody has a question that they would like to ask Priscilla, please um, add that to the question um, pod and I will ask Priscilla. So with the questions you've asked us, Priscilla, has there been any answers that you've kind of come up with at the moment to any of those? <laughs> um. Look, I think, you know, how, how do students, I, I think it's really important for us to ask how students come to know about the experience of other students. I think I was really struck by um, students were absolutely desperate to come and talk to me um, and some of them had never spoken to this stuff, you know, to anyone else before. Um, and some of them felt like, I remember this a student in a, in a very large faculty, so she felt like she was one of about 500 students. She felt like no one knew her and no one would care if she lived or died and um, that she was certainly the only student in that course who would have been struggling. She told me, I'm the only one that would be failing. Um, and I just thought, wow, it's just, you know, sitting on the other side of the fence as a lecturer, you think, wow, this is such a common experience. But I think that's not always understood by students. Um, yeah. So there's something not quite right in our messaging maybe to students that, you know, that gets in the way of them hearing that stuff. Oh, that's great. Um, a question we've got is, do you see a difference between the students you interviewed and perhaps um, business students who may feel greater pressure than other students? I suppose, you know, is there any, you know, different cohort studying than others that kind of experience more um, experience of mental illness? Well, I mean, there, there has been cohort studies done and, you know, they certainly talk about um, medicine students, law students, who um, nursing students who are very reluctant to disclose um, because they quite rightly have very real concerns about how that might affect their, their future careers. Um, you know, and I think that's, you know, that's come up, you know, as, as, as people move into the medical profession, um, you know, there's talk in the media you know, more recently about um, doctors not being able to disclose um, mental health issues and the impact that has on, you know, their patient care, their, their own mental health, um, their suicide rates, those sorts of things. So um, I think they're very real concerns. Students do think about those things, how, um, you know, there's pressure within courses, there's pressure to get jobs at the end of courses. So I think some of those stuff, some of those things make disclosure tough. Um, yeah, and I'm not sure what the answers are, but I think um, maybe not, I, I mean, I guess one of my messages is that um, we need to sh tell students that there's a range of, range of ways to seek support. It doesn't always have to be or only professional support is the only answer. Yep. Um, 
Yeah, so uh, yeah, clearly many students need professional support and get a whole lot of benefit from it. But if they if they feel like that's not an option for them, well, what are the other options? You know, I think increasing students' sense of a range of options. I think um, you know ways that people might anonymously seek support online. We really need to think about well, how do we bolster that? Um, and how do we think more creatively about the ways we can support students without making them feel like disclosure, full disclosure is the only way. Um. Okay, excellent. Um, there's just a question here about using external support services. Has any kind of anything within your research um, kind of brought out, you know, the benefits of that or if that impacted on students at all or? Yep, um, many students were using external supports and found that was a helpful separation. Um, while others talked about it was really good to get their supports from within in the university because then there could be flow on benefits that, you know, someone might be able to contact lecturers and they wouldn't need to um, do all that independently. So I think it's, I mean, again, and I think the message to be giving to students is there's a range of options. You don't, you know, there's not a single way to seek support. Um, you might need to try a couple of different ways before you find a way that works for you and that works for your current setup. Um, and I think encouraging students who might have had a bad experience to say, well, you know, many people have bad experiences help seeking, but there's other ways you can seek help or maybe talking to your friends or maybe, um, you know, Many students spoke about just having one teacher that they could go and offload to um, made a real difference. Yep. So I think, you know, many of us who have worked in that system will probably know that, you know, that is a helpful thing to be offering. It's often, if you're a staff member, it's often something you're not acknowledged for. Um, it's not, you know, that time is not um, considered to form part of your workload. So I think that gets, that gets tricky. Um, but yeah, I think it's a really important role staff can play. Um, yeah. That if students seek you out, that you give a you give a fairly positive, open um, reception to to any help help seeking. Yeah. So just following on from you know academic and teaching staff, um, what are the attitudes and um, of academic staff? What did you find within this the research and um, students finding about their support from them? Was there any kind of anything identified in that? Enormous variation, yeah. yeah. So um, some incredibly negative responses. Um, one student in between our interviews, she decided that she was going to disclose. Um, her experience of disclosure in a health science course was um, she found herself in a group meeting with other students and they were all grouped together as students considered at risk. Um, she didn't know what that meant but uh, you know, she found out that they were all considered at risk of failing a placement. So she was grouped with students who might have been um, international students struggling with English, students who'd failed multiple subjects, and all the students with mental health issues were also pitched into this group. Um, and they were expected to workshop together how they were going to um, overcome their their problem so that they wouldn't fail their placements. Um, oh so, you know, this is not a great response, I'd suggest. <laughs> um, and she was just devastated because she, she really thought about her decision to disclose, made a, what she thought was a, you know, a really clear and strong decision and then had a really negative response and that's, you know, terrible. Yeah, I could understand that. Um, yeah. Did you find that that failing an accessible um, an um, accessible task or a whole unit was a trigger from moving down in the vortex? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, students talked about that. Yeah, health science students in particular um, talked about placements um, when they when they move tasks. So they might have been able to manage quite well in the academic tasks, and then they, when they were moved to a, a placement where there was a range of demands on them. Um, they were out of their comfort zone, that that was a real tricky time. Um, and other students talk, talked about, you know, coming towards the end of semester, everything seemed to collapse. Um, they didn't have access to their usual supports. As the, as, the, as the study pressure went up, their coping strategies went down. Yeah. Which is, you know, I think many of us would connect with. <laughs> yes. Um, another question here is, any further insights on the separation or not between the feelings students have and their ability to function, i.e. your work potentially supports the idea that feelings of difference don't need to equate to unsuccessful functioning? 
Yeah. Well, I saw people who, you know, I don't know, I've worked in mental health and I sort of, you know, instantly would do some sort of um, assessment of people and I saw people with considerable what would be called symptoms of mental illness who were studying and managing and passing quite well. Um, and I guess what I tried to do was not come in with that professional judgment but to actually just sit and listen to students and actually hear from them about their ways and I think students who you know we might think seem to be having considerable challenges with concentrating, remembering, um, articulating thoughts, you know complex ideas, those sort of things, they found ways to do that and do that successfully. And maybe those ways were, you know, they'd really dropped their workload down. So they were doing one subject at a time or, or whatever. So they were stretching things out. Um, but I certainly changed my thinking about, um, you know, the relationship between symptoms or diagnoses and students' capacity. Um, yep. And I know that's not going to be the case for every student, but I think it's really worth rethinking some of those ideas. There's not a, you know, those generic assumptions that we might make don't don't hold up for all students. Excellent. I just got a question here about work. Um, so, were the people, the majority of people interviewed working or not working, do you know? Uh, some, probably about half of them were working. Some of them certainly weren't um, and said, you know, they'd decided I, ca I can't manage, you know, both things. Um, I want to succeed at study, so I'm going to prioritise that. Whereas other people were working, um, had families, you know, bringing up kids, same time, that sort of stuff. So, yeah, yeah there was a range of experiences. Yep, excellent. We're getting um, quite a few questions in now. So Priscilla um, is happy, well, hopefully she's happy to answer any questions afterwards that we'll post on the website. Um, but just one Two quick final questions. One is, um, did your research indicate the trimesterisation or the shortening of study periods have any serious impact on students' health and study outcomes? Uh, I, I wasn't really looking at that. Looking at that, <laughs> that, that. Um, yep. No, so I can't really respond to that. No, Sorry. that's fine. And just finally, um, is your paper published? Um, uh, <laughs> uh, nearly. <laughs> <laughs> it's a coming. Yeah, it's, okay. it's looking for it's looking for a home. Um, yeah, so I just have to do a few tweaks, but hopefully it will be published soon. Okay, so we'll um, be able to kind of let people know who joined us today yeah. when that's out yeah. from the list we've got. So thank yeah. you so very much for, for that. It was a fantastic um, presentation. And um, for those who joined us late, because I, I think the time... Um, zone and difference has, has um, challenged a few of us. Um, the, the recording has been um, um, has been. Sorry, I got distracted. The recording has will be put up online. Um, but so yeah, we'll just go to the last screen just so people have your contact details if they need. You yeah, sure. people to contact you. Yeah. Yep. Um, Absolutely. So that yeah, feel free to give me an email and I can um, if you want to chat over the phone just let me know your number and when when it would suit to talk yep yep and just a quick plug again for our next webinar um, we're actually keeping on the the to topic of um, a lived experience of mental illness for students um, our next webinar will be on the 25th of October at 1 p.m. at the Australian Eastern Daylight Savings Time um, the the topic is uh, quality in tertiary education and psychiatric disability it will explore the development of a vet, vet courses for students with, um, with a lived experience of mental illness um, by a teacher from the vet sector. So that will be great for our um, vet practitioners. So that's it. So um, we're just about to hit the 2 o'clock mark. So you've done very well, Priscilla. <laughs> so well done with your timing. Um, and thank you, everybody, for joining us. Um, and thank you for Bradley Reporting for captioning. And um, I wish you all a glorious rest of the day and rest of the week. Thank you, everybody. Thanks. Bye.